Howdy folks, Justin here. Today, uh, for another episode of From Loser to Legend, make you that guy, if you're starting off, turn you into, I do this every time, that guy, after you learn how to play the game. We're going to uh, talk about lane placement. Uh, to illustrate how this, uh, how, how, how this concept works in Elder Scrolls Legends, we're going to hop into a game versus the AI with a uh, deck that can both play as an early aggressor or an early reactive deck and uh, will help you uh, hopefully figure out what point you pivot from placing creatures in one lane to react to placing them into the other lane to be proactive. So, we're going to hop into the game now with the Purple Storm deck. This is a primarily mono purple deck, a couple yellow cards. Okay, so in general, there's a couple things that you should consider when you're deciding where to place your creatures. Um, in the early game, if you suspect, we're not keeping any of these cards, we want uh, lower cost cards. In the early game, if you suspect that you are the defending or reactive player, you want to do things like place your first guard creature into a shadow lane unless there's already a creature in the field lane that you can oppose and, and should oppose because you can favorably trade. Um, the kind of flip side of this is true if you're the aggressor. If you're the aggressive player in the early game, uh, or you suspect you will be because sometimes you have to decide pretty soon, you want to start off by placing your creatures into the field lane. You do this because this allows you in subsequent turns as you lose control of the field lane to move unopposed into the shadow lane where your creatures will be able to get in at least one attack before they're responded to by your opponent. In this case, we uh, are the uh, control deck, we are the reactive deck, so we're going to put our reactive defense creature over here. We could have played Windkeep Spellsword over there as well, but Windkeep Spellsword has a little bit more utility potentially as a more aggressive creature to be used later on, and right now we just want to handle that situation. Our opponent's already doing what we were just talking about. They know they're the aggressor right now, so they're moving, pivoting immediately into the shadow lane, which isn't going to work out particularly well for them, because now we can respond. We're going to take a little damage, but we can respond with a bigger creature in the shadow lane. But you see how the AI is making the same kind of moves that we're talking about here. Vicious Drow. All right, so now we have a couple choices, right? We can lay down the spell sword and the defender, um, and our defender is just going to get eaten right away by our drow, which would then let us trade our haunting spirit into it. Or we can lay down the gloom wraith, which will come down as a five-five. Uh, the defender is doing a great job of funneling our opponent's creatures into one lane, which is, as the currently reactive player, how we want to be setting things up. Now, if we lay down both of these this turn, we're going to start the next turn with a. Uh, Haunting Spirit, Windkeep Spell Sword, and Fire and Defender in play, assuming no shenanigans from our opponent. Um, if we lay down the Gloom Wraith, we're going to probably get this killed by this, but we don't know for certain. Um, the, our opponent might realize that they're quickly losing control of the board with their smaller, more aggressive creatures to our more higher value creatures. I think in this case, because we're still in the defensive position, we want to hold on to the guard creature until we can excise maximum value from it. So we're going to lay down the Gloom Wraith. We're going to kill the Mud Crab. And we are going to go face. Maybe, if we're not crashing. <laughs> there we go. Pass the turn back to our opponent, Root Walker. He did exactly as we anticipated. Probably would have been nicer if we got that over there, but we didn't. And now our opponent is playing Lumbering Ogre which is an interesting card, cannot gain cover, so the fact that they put it into the same lane as our massive Gloom Wraith is not ideal for our opponent. Now we are going to break a rune if we swing with this, so we're only swinging with this to remove that. And then you'll see we are being rewarded for holding on to our Thaw Rune Defender. And now we have a choice, right? We can Stalwart Ally or Wind Keep Spell Sword. I think we're going to make most effective use of our Magicka, and we're going to now pivot to being the aggressor by laying down the stalwart ally in the field lane. <clears throat> giving us an unopposed lane where we have some aggressive creatures. And our opponent is forced to react by becoming, uh, you know, this might be the choice if they weren't interested in removing some of our threats, but they know that we can just slam into that with the breakthrough, 
which is like trample and magic. It only needs to do damage necessary to kill the creature, and the rest of the damage will spill over to the opposing player. And uh, they want to start clearing out a lane. We're not going to give them that opportunity. We are going to now make the full pivot to aggression. We're going to play Queen Keep Spell Sword and Edict of Azura this turn. We didn't hit a prophecy when we broke those runes, and I don't think we want to necessarily break one yet, so we're just going to lay down our spell sword over there. Spreading out our threats, we obviously have a lot more power in the shadow lane, but what I like, ooh, that was a great play for our, our opponent. What I liked about that play, however, was that it lets us hide powerful creatures behind the guards over here, which we are going to do. We're going to go face for five, break one rune, and again, we're going to pivot back over to this lane. And we're going to actually throw the Deadly Draugr in this lane so that we spawn a 3-3 three, three over here, giving us more uh, more power over there than we would otherwise have if we just threw the Deadly Draugr over there. Okay, opponent goes face, breaks one of our runes. Okay, 13 damage is what we need to kill him. I don't think we have 13. We have 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Um, right. So I think what we're going to do is we're going to try to set up for lethal next turn. To do that, we're going to remove this, swing last with our deadly draugr in case he prophecies a guard creature, uh, which he would be incentivized to play in that lane otherwise. And then we're going to lay down our night shadow. And we're going to take potentially up to 14 damage from our opponent this turn, but I'm not super concerned with it. Um, because we have so much damage on board now, as well as two ways in hand to remove uh, guards if our opponent is able to conjure up any of those, which it doesn't look like they are. Alright, so that was an example of which lane we're starting off in for which purposes, as well as pivoting between the lanes from our opponent and us as the direction of the game shifted. We're going to play one more game to illustrate some more of these principles. Got our award there for playing against the AI. And we're going to do it with an aggro deck. Unlike the Purple Storm deck, which was more of a mid range uh, deck, we're going to use the Yellow Belly Goblins deck, which is an aggro deck, which will illustrate the uh, shifting in response to reactive plays as opposed to the uh, shifting in response to our opponent's um, aggression. We're going to shift in response to their defense. We're going to keep, that's a one drop and a zero drop, we're going to ditch the four drop, see if we can get another one drop. Perfect. So we can play all three of these cards in our first turn. And this is interesting. Our opponent put a one three down. One of the cards we have in hand, uh, two of them actually, we'll just fold to this. So we are going to start the game off immediately shifting to both lanes. Um, we're going to put that over there to oppose that. And then we're going to throw both of these down over here to try and uh, confuse our opponent about where their guard creature should go. And this is actually pretty good for us. This is a very high value creature, and I like the way that turned out. So we're going to swing for four. Our opponent has a two power drain creature, which isn't great. We have a drain creature of our own now. We're going to go ahead and throw down the Murkwater Butcher over here and just keep uh, piling on the damage in that lane until we meet some opposition. We can race even a two Magicka Drain. Um, and this is perfect. We have a creature that can remove that. You know what I prefer doing this turn, however, is playing our Divine Fur, sacrificing this creature, and hitting our opponent's face for seven damage. Um, you know, a Prophecy card would be not ideal, but we are the aggro deck, and we need to push face damage. So It looks like you got some if it's Piercing Javelin, Sparking Spider, and our opponent recognizes that uh, we have more damage over here than they can handle, and maybe incorrectly assumes that they can race us. But if they have removal, they very well could. And they have another Sparking Spider, okay. So this guy currently has Drain and Regenerate. Um, we are going to remove it with this, because we want to keep 
hitting the pilfer trigger on that. There we have a guard creature. Um, I think what we're going to do is play the slaughterfish spawning. We're going to lose one of our slaughterfish, but what this allows us to do is play a uh, three drop alongside our during cut first next turn, which is probably better than um, playing a two drop alongside our slaughterfish spawning next turn. All right, this is a little sad. Um, obviously, we're going to sacrifice the butcher. It's the weakest of our creatures. We are going to break a rune, and so to that end, we're going to go face first. And no prophecy. Now, you know, we could ask ourselves, do we want to start cleaning up what we have over here? I think the answer is no. So we're going to play both our creatures into that lane again. Uh, our opponent is just not giving us any reason, really, to pivot over to this lane. And we're not giving them any reason to pivot either. Top card of their library, uh, not triggering this. I'm guessing Crushing Blow, maybe Gold Brand, a couple of neutral cards. Uh, this still doesn't have Breakthrough, so we're not going to slam through one of those guards and remove it. Um, we're just going to hold on to Dune Smuggler, actually. Go Face now has Ward, so I believe Breakthrough is the only keyword it doesn't have anymore. And we'll hit with this first. No runes broken from, um, I'm sorry, no prophecies triggered. And feel free, the, uh, I have a couple videos where I play this deck, the uh, Yellow Velvet Goblins deck, and if you're interested in farming the AI for uh, Soul Shards, this would be a good deck to do that with. Because we have just completely smashed our opponent. We'll swing like this, end the game at 34 life, and finish our opponent off. So that's just a couple basic concepts about lane placement, making sure you know who is the aggressor, who is the defender, who is the reactive player. And once you have that sort of information uh, available to you, once you know which position you're in, you should be able to do pretty well. Uh, just to recap, if you're the aggressor, you want to start your early, creature, your early offensive creatures in the field lane, so you have the opportunity to pivot into the shadow lane, so you're guaranteed, hopefully, at least one hit with them. If you're the reactive player and you're playing onto an unopposed board, you want to start your early guards into the shadow lane so that you can uh, inc you know, incentivize your opponent to stay in the field lane where you can make trades more easily. And when you are then pivoting to the attack as the defensive player, you don't mind putting them in the field lane or the shadow lane. You want to position your drain creatures, if you have them as the reactive player, behind guards, so that's likely to be the shadow lane where you're laying down your early guards. And if you're the aggressive player, don't hesitate to do like we just did in this match, where we just kept piling and piling into the same lane because we weren't meeting any resistance. There's no reason to make a chain to pivot or spread your cards out unless you specifically know that your opponent is running a card that will punish you for uh, piling into one lane. In that case, because we had the warded lethal creature, we weren't worried about any uh, guards, and um, the only card that could have really punished us is Dawn's Wrath, which destroys all creatures in a lane. So that is episode two of From Loser to Legend. A couple, uh, just, you know, a couple pieces of information about how I approach putting my creatures onto the board. Hopefully you found it useful, and I will see you next weekend for another episode of From Loser to Legend. Thanks, guys.